All right, so it's close enough to four, so I'll just go ahead and get started. Um, I'm gonna talk today about shrinking your APK by example. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name's Bess, I'm on the games team at the New York Times. So I'm responsible for the uh, New York Times crossword app for Android. Uh, we're on the Play Store, been there for about a year, uh, and there's my Twitter, if you wanna follow me. Um, so why is shrink your APK? Um, one reason that I think of is I implemented the uh, crossword as an instant app uh, for the uh, for promotion at I.O. And so that was definitely with a four megabyte limit, it took a lot of creative shrinking and uh, picking up harder APK. So I want to try and talk about what I learned from uh, having to shrink a production. Uh, but why would you care about APK size? At some point, at the end of the day, people are paying to download your app. Not everyone has a fancy unlimited data plan. Uh, definitely people in emerging markets, if you're targeting that, people are paying to download your app. Again, if you're doing an instant app, you have that hard format limit per feature module. You can add feature modules if you're able to architect your app to do that, but at some point you have formatted resources to play with. Um, and then also Google had done some research and found that for every, uh, I think it was six meg of download size, it would cost you 1% of conversion rate uh, for downloads. So a smaller app is gonna get more users. And there's a, a site to the Google study uh, if you were looking for facts to back up the assertion there. So we're gonna talk about some strategies to go and shrink your app. And these are in varying um, difficulty and level of like permanent commitment that you have to make to uh, doing this. So easy is finding out to use the resources in your app package and uh, stripping them out. Next thing is finding the resources you have and convert them to smaller formats. Uh, you can turn on ProGuard and Resource Shrinker in the Android tool chain. Um, sometimes it's helpful to tune the way you're doing ProGuard and shrinking your resources to kind of poke around and see maybe if there's places where you can go and actually give hints to the tools to get them to remove more links. And then finally, you can use uh, APK splits where you're actually going to generate a different APK for density and binary architecture. And there's a great tool called the APK Analyzer that helps you like you kind of go along your journey here. So we have an example app. Um, it's an app for cat pictures because cat pictures are awesome. Um, it has two flavors, free and paid. And there's one activity in each flavor uh, for one free cat picture. And then the second one is a paid cat picture activity. So initially we're not using any shrinking or any of the tools. And when you, uh, in the free flavor for this app, uh, it just checks, does a, uh, hey, what's my flavor in the main activity and says, okay, if it's free, then make that button visible. So you can kind of follow along with this app here. Uh, the source code's on GitHub, and that's a capital S and five. It's kind of a little ambiguous there. Um, so the APK Analyzer is a great little tool that's in Android Studio. There's also a command line utility. Uh, that lets you do the same thing if you're going to write some scripts and you want to go and see what's in your APK. Um, you can get to it from the tool setting in uh, the tools pull down menu in Studio, or if you just drag an APK right down on top of the uh, right onto the uh, Studio window, it'll open it for you. Um, it gives you some cool size metrics by your APK. You can actually pick apart all the resources that you have inside your APK. And then you can also kind of peer down into the decks and see your classes, see your methods, and even right click on method name and see the actual bytecode uh, for that method. So for instance, here's kind of an idea of what the screen looks like. You get your uh, sizes of your resources and your source. We can take a look here at the uh, code in the decks file and kind of drill on down. So we'll look into my example app source code here. And you can even look at you know, the methods here. Uh, or then you can do the same thing with the resources. So we can look at res and drill in, and you can actually see these by density broken down. And so here's the cat pictures that I have embedded in the app. So 
one thing we want to try to do while we're shrinking this APK and applying the strategy is to try and figure out some metrics so we know what we're actually doing. So our baseline about doing anything at all is 2.2 meg. Now this is totally contrived fake out. So uh, you know, it's <clears throat> gonna be a little bit meaningless these numbers, but at the same time it should show that there's some meaningful change at the end of the day once we apply the strategies. So the first thing uh, we wanna look at here is removing unused resources. Now, maybe you got that asset from a designer, you put it in the project and forgot about it. You know, you changed your mind, moved on, and that thing is just sitting in the project. Um, maybe you deleted some code in the past and forgot to remove the corresponding assets. So that layout that you left sitting around there, or an image that was referring to. Um, we've all been there, uh, software moves fast, that's why Android gives you uh, lib tools for finding unused resources and highlighting them out, calling them out to you. So use your lip checks. When you run it, you get a report, lovely little material design HTML report. And here we found, there's this image here from the, the Times lobby that I took a picture of, and I was gonna put this in the app too. Changed my mind, forgot about it. If we go and look at it in the APK analyzer, there it is. The, uh, you know, just even one of the densities of uh, splits here is taking up almost 100K of our APK. So, Let's go ahead and get rid of that. And we've saved, you know, we were at 2.1 meg, or 2.2 meg, now we're at 2.1. So easy peasy, low hanging fruit. The next thing is to look at how do we convert resources to smaller formats? So, you know, you may end up looking at things like JPEGs or PNGs. Uh, you may find yourself building images in Sketch, like, uh, drawing out something in the UI, you know, maybe your designer's drawing something that might be better as a vector graphic uh, in Sketch and just export it to a PNG. So one thing you can do is go and export that to a vector draw. Another thing is that raster images that you have as a JPEG right now, photographs, things like that might be better converted to WebP. And I've also found that even things that were vector-ish that look good in PNG also look pretty good as lossless uh, web key images. Um, and then also look at your audio assets. So one thing we have in the crossword app at the times is a little uh, jingle that plays when uh, you finish the puzzle. Now this was like 150K, 175K MP3, and by changing it to an AUG, we're able to kind of find a lower, a much lower bit rate, so a lower size, but that sounded just as good as the MP3. So if you have audio assets, consider maybe something other than MP3 in your, uh, your what you're bundling. So for WebP images, Studio has this really cool tool for changing uh, your images to WebP. And so it actually lets you figure the uh, compression factor by looking at the difference between the original image and how uh, it would look after compression. So as we move this slider from, you know, one end of the quality spectrum to the other, you can actually look at the, uh, the difference. I'm going to make replay that. And if you kind of look in the middle, you can see where the, uh, and the projector may not be showing very well here. But you can actually see where it's doing, uh, it's calculating the difference between one image and the other, and then displaying that in the middle. So you can end up kind of moving the slider from left to right and see where the, uh, the difference in the middle looks acceptable to you. Like I found once I got to about you know 75% quality, you couldn't really see any like noticeable difference in this middle pane. Um, but it also saved uh, a significant file savings. So when we convert those image assets to WebP at 75% compression, we've gotten 400 kilobytes knocked off the top of the end. So WebP gave us a lot of uh, head repair. So we're kind of moving a little bit up here with just a few of these strategies. So next thing here is looking at ProGuard and uh, resource stream. So you notice that we focus solely on resources right now. 
there was still a whole megabyte of decks in our little tool right now. Um, and then there's a whole lot of unused resources brought in by the support library since we are using an app compat that's in the office. And so, you know, this is kind of a contrived toy example, but a lot of apps have unused code as well. So, for instance, we're using, uh, on the crossword app at the times, we're, we have a shared library for, uh, that we share with the newspaper uh, reader app team that handles all the things like logging in your account and subscribing to a product uh, confirming that if you buy an IEP through uh, the Google Play Store that you know we can actually assign that to your NY Times account on uh, our back end um, and so there's a lot of code that they give us that we're maybe not using and so you know if you think of all the libraries you have that you're pointing to your Android app uh, from third parties even internally there's probably a lot of unused code that you're using that um, you can get rid of and then you also find, I mean, we're using a uh, hockey app, for instance, for crash reporting, but we don't use its facilities for uh, beta software distribution. And there are all sorts of other code in there for facilitating, uh, you know, checking for whether your app and hockey app has an update and giving the user a prompt for, uh, hey, don't download this. So, You'll probably, you'd probably be surprised how much of your libraries have any stuff that you don't even know about is in there. So we'll go ahead and uh, enable ProGuard in our app, in our build.gradle for a release build. And we run that, and obviously again, this, because this is totally a toy example, uh, we knocked out you know, 700k of decks, give or take. And so now we're at uh, 1.1 meg. So we've saved a meg relative to baseline by getting rid of all that unused code. Um, obviously, with ProGuard, you need to be uh, judicious about starting to think about keeping your uh, classes that matter where there's not like an explicit uh, reference to the code in your app. So, instance, uh, if you do, and we'll get to some of this here in, uh, in terms of things you use in XML and layouts. Uh, but things that matter might be uh, if you're using a uh, JSON deserializer, you might find yourself in a situation where if you use private, if you have uh, data model classes that have a private field and you're letting JSON do reflection to find that private field, uh, ProGuard will often end up getting rid of that private field and then you'll end up having uh, crashes when you try and actually use those values. So. Uh, you'll end up having to write some keep directives in ProGuard to, to build that. Um, that kind of stuff is maybe out of the scope of this presentation, but the uh, one nice thing is that it's possible to include uh, ProGuard directives in an Android library. So hopefully all the libraries you're using are providing a ProGuard file to make sure that the bare minimum of functionality still works. Um, and one thing that I found that helps when you're using ProGuard is if you are able to break your app out into separate libraries to make it make more sense, uh, that helps when you're doing ProGuard because you're able to kind of limit the amount of thinking you have to care about to that one library when you're writing, okay, I'm, I have a, uh, a library that I'm using in my app just for making REST calls to my back end, and I have data options for deserializing things. I can only, I, the only thing I have to care about and keep in my mind while we're working about this is just, let's think about it, our data model classes. And you know, at, at the end of the day, maybe the easiest thing is just to put the keep notation at the top of that class uh, that program gives you and let it keep it for you. Um, so once we've gotten rid of the code, uh, we want to look at resources. So the tool chain has code to shrink resources in your app. It searches for references in your code to resources and in your layouts, and then it removes things that didn't get seen. It can also strip the resources that were referenced by an unused library code that ProGuard got rid of. And it does this because it's analyzing the code after ProGuard's had a chance to go and pick it apart. And so uh, if you go into the uh, build.gradle, alongside uh, Minify, Minify enabled, you can also turn on the shrink resources. 
Now, the reason why I said this is kind of higher up on that level of commitment uh, continuum is that in order for shrink resources to work, you also have to turn on programmer. Uh, you can't can't have one without the other. So it's kind of the trade-off where if you would do want to start using this, you're going to have to start thinking about uh, the implications of ProGuard in your app. So once we enable the resource shrinker, uh, we have found, why don't we say 10K? It's a little weird. We got rid of some things out of the, uh, uh, the library of resources, but let's go and hook around and do some optimization here. So, If we look at our main activity class, we have, uh, we're going to go ahead and find those buttons in the main activity, and then if we're on the, a flavor that allows the big picture, we'll go ahead and make that button visible, and we'll send it on click listener to the launch paid cat picture method, and otherwise we're just going to set that visibility to gone. Now, we're able to set up a, uh, a flavor config class that's specified across flavors. So there's one in the, the free flavor tree and there's one in the paid flavor tree. And if we make this uh, static config uh, variable allow paid pictures to false, what really should happen is that this whole thing here uh, should just get compiled right out. And then we end up with just uh, setting that to dawn, and that should just be what we see in our compiled code. And similarly, since we're no longer calling it this launch paint cat picture me method, ProGuard really should be getting rid of that. And so then our activity should look like something like this. A little bit simpler here. Uh, when we, if we're to actually look at the bytecode. code. So let's go back to the analyzer and take a look. Show my code here. And so I kind of exercised a little bit of a here to uh, make it a little bit more clear. But we're actually going to go ahead here and do a find view by ID. And we're going to find that uh, click for another cat picture. And then we're going to cast that to a button. And then we're going to invoke set visibility on that button. So that's all the byte code that's there. So that worked. What's weird is we go back to the APK analyzer and unused and unlaunched activity didn't get stripped by program. And also, if we go into our paid picture activity that didn't get stripped down, um, you notice that we have, uh, we set background resources to the image view here of you know, and we set it to the cat2.jpg, which is uh, our paid cat picture. So, we go into our uh, resources, we find that not only is activity still there, but the resource it referred to is also still there. But what's weird is, let's go into uh, find usages in the APK analyzer, and which of course you can see where this is being referred to, anywhere in your project. And I'm pretty sure that it's not being used anywhere. Yeah, okay, so nobody's pointing at it. So why is it still there? And so the, uh, this kind of takes us into a little bit about how the Android toolchain works. So there's the Android asset packaging tool that ends up auto-generating ProGuard rules for classes that are referred to in your layout and your uh, other XMLs, your, your manifest and your layouts. And so if you kind of look around in your builds intermediate path, you'll find this file aaptrules.txt. And it'll, you'll find it's actually generating a ProGuard heap directive for the paid picture activity. And it's going to tell you why this is there. So it's saying, hey, we found this at our Android manifest.xml. And honestly, when you think back about this, it made sense why. Because Android apps can be launched not just through an explicit intent where the class name is explicitly declared in your code, but you might have intent filters declared in your uh, in your manifest, uh, you might have uh, you know any number of places where it's not a direct 
uh, reference to that class name in your code. So if you got rid of it willy-nilly, uh, it might blow up in your face. If, for instance, the incident filter were still in your manifest yet, uh, the activity underlying that that code runs out. So AAP, AAPT tries to you know do us a solid by leaving that there. Sometimes though, uh, you know it doesn't. Uh, it puts it there when we don't want it. So let's give AAPT a little bit of a nudge here to say, hey, let's actually get rid of this. So we're gonna go and create a manifest under the free flavor tree. And what, what we want to do is tell the tools, hey, we don't actually care about the paint picture activity in our free flavor. Um, we're not going to use it. We're not going to launch it. So let's just pretend it doesn't exist. And so if we, uh, we add here a dummy application uh, group here, and then also declare our activity, but we're gonna go and add this, this guy here is an hint to the manifest order to say, uh, take whatever you see in the manifest coming ahead of you uh, from the main and the manifest XML and remove this one activity from the set. And if you look at the Android manifest, uh, the free manifest, there's a cool little tab on, in Studio under it that shows you the merge manifest as a result. Um, and you can see that the activity got removed. For some reason, I had a slide here uh, that showed that, and it's, I had something deleted. Uh, but if we got rid of that, now let's go back to the APK analyzer. So, success. The activity is gone. And if we notice we had two uh, inner classes, anonymous inner classes for the listeners of the on-click listener, that other on-click listener is also gone as well. And so once we got rid of the uh, unused activity, we also got rid of the resource that it referred to. So now the only one we have here in our free flavor is the free cat picture. So we successfully trimmed down the UK size a little bit more and we got rid of uh, a resource that we didn't want to distribute to non-paying customers. So now if we look at this stuff here, we get to uh, unused code and resources stripped out for real this time. We're now down to 1.1 meg from our 2.2 meg app. Now, there's some caveats here about this that are worth pointing out that uh, if you're building an instant app, shrink resources right now doesn't um, there's an open bug on the bug tracker for this. I know, uh, I guess there were a few of us who were in on the early access for the instant apps, and at that point, it did work. Uh, but when they officially put out the 3.0 greater plugin and uh, with the official public support for instant apps, uh, if you have a feature module, which is the effectively the output uh, artifact for an instant app, uh, APK, you can't run some shrink resources on it. Um, hopefully they'll put it back. It sounds like they're going to, uh, but right now it's something you're going to have to work around if you're doing an instant app. Um, finally, there's uh, APK splits. So, what if we could have uh, a separate APK file for each screen density and binary architecture that we support. Why should someone have to download all those resources that you know, they're not going to use? And if we do this, we'd be able to uh, shrink each APK down just by delivering the only things that matter to that particular device. You know, this is especially pointed out if you're using the NDK because native loops can be really big. Um, maybe you have a very resource dense game, you know, game a lot of images, sprites, audio effects, things like that. If you've not got some images that aren't going to be rendered, uh, you can save some uh, money on your user's behalf there. So we can go in our build that gradle in our Android block here and declare uh, APK splits. So 
Here we're going to go and split for uh, screen density. So this will compi uh, configure uh, an output APK for each screen density, you know, L LDPI, MDPI, all the way up to triple X HDPI. And you can also set a compatible list of screens for the manifest. And what's nice is that when you go, uh, your user's phone goes to the Play Store to try and fetch a package, it's going to find the highest uh, version code and uh, device density mapping that works for it and pull that down. So if you're, uh, there's an APK up there that matches the fact that I have on my Pixel 2 is an XX HDPI device, that's what I'm going to end up getting served to me. You can also do the same thing here for uh, APK splits. So uh, for uh, this, uh, sorry, for ABI, uh, application by interface or architecture. So you can go ahead and generate a separate APK for x86, uh, ARMv7, MIPS. I don't think anything actually uses a MIPS anymore, but if you do provide it, I guess you can go into this one for it. Um, and if you also still wanted to provide a universal APK that had all the things, I, this, the tools will allow that for you. So, what I did here was, uh, since I'm not using native code in this example, the only thing I care about is the uh, density splits. And I went ahead and told it, I actually, in our uh, code, I, I told it I don't really care about LDPI. Those people can get the universal one because there's nothing that's left. I don't want to manage so many packages. So here we have when we go and build this, we get APKs for each display density. And so we have an HDPI, MDPI, X, and double X, and then one universal for everyone else as a catch all. So the thing is here, there's kind of a caveat about this, and this is a, a peculiarity of the Play Store and how it handles version codes. So you can only have one uh, version code and APK mapping, so you can't reuse the same version code. So how do you handle this where you have to actually publish multiple APKs and then also tell uh, the store what the most recent version is that you want to download? So we got to be a little bit creative and we want to make sure that devices still get the highest version code that maps to the characteristics of their device. <coughs> so what if we could go and steal some numbers, some number places within the uh, version code and use that? So maybe we do for MDP, you know, we could assign each uh, density a value from you know, one to four. And then if our version code was 100, we're just gonna steal the uh, 10,000th place in that version code. So we'll have our normal version code and then we're gonna add uh, 10,000 times that you know, density identifier to go and build a bigger number. Um, and you could probably, even, if you weren't going to have more than 10,000 builds, uh, you got up to 2.1 billion is the maximum value for a uh, version code on an APK. So you could go and extend out a few more places if you wanted to. Um, but you'll find that, uh, for instance, like the Play Services APK. Uh, has separate ABI and version splits, or uh, ABI and uh, density splits. And they do something like this. And if the uh, projector will come back, I'm gonna show you how we make this happen. So in our build.gradle, we can add uh, a block of code like this. So we only care about density splits. So I'm not going to do the same thing for the ABI 
Um, but we'll go ahead and assign each density a value for the version code. For each of the output files we get out, uh, we're going ahead and get what their density is, and we're going to get it out of this mapping and get that number. Uh, and then we're going to multiply that by 10,000 to get what the uh, 10,000 place value should be, and then add our normal version code on top of it. So that's how we get, you know, 4,000 for our 4,000 or 40,100 for our real uh, app version code 100. Now, because a universal app doesn't have a specified density. Uh, this is where it's going to fall, uh, fall through this bit of logic here. And that app is still going to get, or that app BK is still going to get the, the normal uh, unmolested 100 version code. And the idea here is then that it's low enough in the hierarchy that it won't get plucked normally. But if there's no uh, workable mapping for that device otherwise, it's going to be like the fallback all the way to the end. And since it's still higher than the version code for the last universal APK you published, uh, you're still going to be all right. Now, the reason why I say that this is a certain level of commitment uh, at the highest point is that version codes are forever. So if you end up starting to monkey with your version code and then you, you, know, you change your mind, now you've got to remember that you have your highest value uh, and to keep in mind in your CI or whatever the builds is not build number 100, but build number 40,100. Um, so definitely something to keep in mind as well. But you know, you, you do end up, as I said, you have 2.1 billion uh, choices to choose from. So if you need to go to something higher and go back to a, a normal sequential version code, you're probably going to be okay. Um, if you're doing this with instant apps, uh, it's a little bit different. I don't have uh, a chance to go into that here today, but what they have, uh, if you look at the instant app documentation, they have something called pure splits. And that is a, you know, because the instant app framework uh, is able to generate APKs that are uh, split up with the different code and resources, you, you know, it's able to lean on the instant app's uh, ability to grab the right APK with the right density. And so you don't have to do this version code tomfoolery for your instant app feature modules when they build an APK. Um, you just get your zip file that has all your instant app artifacts. It's just going to have a bunch more APKs in it than when you start. Uh, not just one for each feature module, but one for each feature module and uh, density combination. So, but if you're using the tools at that point, uh, you don't really need to worry about it. It just it's kind of sad to forget it. Um, so that's pretty nice. So how do we do here now? Um, so for the double X HDPI version of our free APK app, we've done density splits. Uh, we got down to uh, about 800K. So we've saved on this 2.2 meg app, uh, we've saved 1.4 meg at the end of the day. So these are some strategies that really kind of help out um, with you know, saving your users some money. Um, places to look that I would suggest if you want to do this, uh, definitely take a look at the merge manifest in your app and see what activities and craziness is coming in from your libraries that you're using because you may be able to go ahead and uh, selectively remove some things. You know, and they may be coming in from places you don't expect. Um, to go back to the example I had from our uh, Times Crossword app, and I mentioned that libraries often import separate activities. Uh, the, our, our library that handles login and e-commerce and IEPs, for instance, because you know, we allow Facebook login, you can have, um, it uses the Facebook SDK. Now, for our instant app, we're not using login. Uh, we're just pointing people say, hey, go and download the full version if you want to plug in. So we don't care so much about the uh, login activity or any of the things that, that come in from Facebook for that purpose. What we do care about is Facebook's um, 
analytics. We want to be able to make sure that if we bought a Facebook ad for our app that linked to the instant app page, that's all a metric tracking that showed that we got some value for our money for buying that ad, so it works. So we do care about that, some of that code, but for the instant app, we don't want that Facebook activity that does all the initialization for login. So that's a place where we were able to go and strip out, hey, uh, we don't you know, remove that one activity from just the instant app. Same thing for hockey app. We were able to do that at the global level because we don't care about anything other than crash reporting. Um, but if you're using third party, if you're using shared libraries within your own company, you may end up finding that your colleagues on some other team are pulling in uh, code you didn't expect. And you know, if it's politically inconvenient to go and lobby them to go and change their architecture so that that doesn't show in, uh, at least there's some ways that you can take a look at uh, where you can selectively remove things. So uh, I guess with that, I'll open the floor for any questions. Yes? Can you clarify, is it easy to tell what ProGuard has removed? Yes. Because like, you were talking about how like, you, know, you might end up with a crash and you've got to figure that out. Yeah, so ProGuard creates a, log, uh, a great big haunted log file. Okay. In the intermediates, uh, the intermediates path in your uh, build directory is like a gold mine. Um, there's some great stuff there from the manifest merger. So if you're trying to debug a uh, some weirdness of why something shows up in your manifest, that's a great place to look. Uh, ProGuard generates a log of what it's stripped. So and why. Oh. So like. Uh, it, the first thing you look, we always look at is if we have a weird funky crash in, in production that's not happening in develop, it's always, okay, is this, did ProGuard get rid of something that we expected to stick in? Um, then uh, one thing that's also handy too is in the, uh, if you're using ProGuard to obfuscate your code, um, the, the APK analyzer has a, uh, a way to import the mapping file that ProGuard generates. So it, it generates a, uh, a file called mapping.test that ends up in the, uh, the intermediates as well. And that's actually the original class names map back to whatever obfuscated uh, fake name that ProGuard gave it. So that when you uh, want to debug some, what's going on in the analyzer, you can see that. And then the ProGuard mapping is also really handy for uh, trying to look at a stat trace when all you see is goblin code. Um, like we, we, one thing that's really cool about ProGuard is you can also do a, a custom obfuscation dictionary. So we've actually, we downloaded a, a list of the longest words to ever appear as answers in the Times crossword. And so we end up getting obf uh, obfuscated stat traces that are like, you know, Call that you know com that n with times dot crate shaft. Call that com dot n with times dot army worms. You know all these weird uh, things that were clues in, in the crossword years ago. Um, but yeah, the the intermediate directory there is going to have all sorts of stuff for helping you kind of see where you're going with this as well. In in addition to just that, hey, you can see. yes. Um. <clears throat> The point where it's talking about the, I guess, cleaning up the unused resources and whatnot. Yeah. How does uh, when you have the backwards compatible vector drawables, so it converts your vectors to PNGs, I believe, in the old pre lollipop devices? Like, is there a way you have to like specify to like deal with that? That's a good question. I haven't actually. Uh, let's see. I think we were. Uh, on the project I'm on right now, we were having some other reasons why we couldn't go directly to a vendor drawable because all our stuff was done in Sketch. And Sketch has some really, depending on how you drew them in Sketch, yeah. uh, you end up with, uh, the library doesn't really yeah. render them the way we hoped. So until I can have our designer uh, redraw them in such a manner that uh, vector drawable doesn't render them ugly. Yeah. Uh, we weren't able to run with it, so I, I don't have a direct experience on, on that. Yeah. Yes? So I've heard a rumor that on iOS, if you're 
your app is bigger than 100 megs, when people go to download it, the app store will be like, hey, this app's really big, are you sure? Or something like that. Um, does anything like that happen on Android? Like, I know, obviously, like, if, if it takes forever to download your app, yeah. a lot of people will abandon it, but do people, like, get a, a wait for warning like that? Yeah, I can't remember what the threshold is on, it, it's worse on iOS even, because it's not like, are you sure? It's like, get on Wi-Fi or don't download it at all. Yeah. Uh, at least Android does say, hey, are you sure you want to download it? I think it may be 100 meg or 200 meg is what the threshold is. But definitely, yeah, like, there's some magic numbers, like, yeah, 4 meg, for instance, and then whatever that Wi-Fi warning threshold is where, uh, you know, you get it down 100k below that and you're able to actually get more people wanting to download it. Like, I, I spent a good, you know, week, like trying to find where I could get like a few bytes here and there out on the uh, uh, the crossword instant app. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you very much.